Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Be, uh, before we begin tonight, I just wanted to uh, draw attention to something that I have up here at, uh, on my desk. This is a, uh, an American flag that was presented to the city of Kingston. And uh, to provide some context, I'll read the uh, accompanying letter. It's from the Ambassador of the United States. It says, to the city of Kingston, Ontario, in my role as the U.S. Ambassador to Canada, I am honored to extend the best wishes of Americans to the people of Kingston and all Canadians as they celebrate the 200th anniversary of the birth of Canada's Father of Confederation, Sir John A. Macdonald. Your first Prime Minister played the key role in achieving Confederation. In doing so, Sir John A. Macdonald also created a firm friend, neighbor, and continental partner that my country has relied upon ever since. It is my pleasure to present your city with this flag of the United States of America flown over the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa on January the 11th, 2015, in honor of Sir John A. Macdonald. Happy 200th birthday, Sir John A. Sincerely, Bruce Heyman. So this flag will uh, be on display in my office for the time being, and then we will probably pass it off to, uh, to our curator, Mr. Robertson, to find uh, another spot for it in City Hall. But we look forward to uh, receiving other light gifts uh, over uh, the year 2015. All right, so we were in committee of the whole closed session. So Mr. Clerk, I'll ask for a motion. This is moved by Councillor Neal, second by Councillor Bohm. The council rise from committee of the whole closed meeting that the rules of bylaw 2010-1 be waived and that the chair report. Please vote. That carries. So it's moved by Councillor Neal and second by Councillor Bohm that Committee of the Whole closed meeting, which was recessed, be reconvened prior to the consideration of the pro of the prior consideration of the bylaws in order to complete the Committee of the Whole closed meeting agenda. Please vote. That carries. Just, um, just to make everyone aware, as noted on our ads tonight, the second item that was listed under our closed meeting, which was the discussion of the OMB appeal for the casino, uh, was postponed to a later meeting. So we just dealt with the first item on the agenda. Now with that, I will ask for an approval of the edits. Moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Holland. Please vote. And that carries. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Councillor Bohm. I, Ryan Bowman, of the, corporate, of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Clinks, Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause A, page 28, report number 13, and Clause E, report number 10. As an employee of Utilities Kingston, it may be perceived that I have a pecuniary interest in this matter. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Is there anyone else that has a disclosure pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none. We have no presentations tonight, but we do have a number of delegations. Uh, so, uh, going by the list that's on the added, our first delegation is uh, Yana Marikova, who will appear before Council to speak to new motion three with respect to the inclusion of all permanent residents who have resided in Kingston as eligible for appointment to city committees. Ms. Marikova. And just a reminder that as a delegation, you have five minutes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mayor, Councillors. Uh, I would like to speak to the motion regarding eligibility for appointment to city committees, and we'll start with my own story. Uh, 
I moved to Kingston from the Czech Republic five, five years ago to join my German husband, who studied at uh, Queen's, a PhD program. Uh, I myself have two degrees in law from a Czech and an English university. I have worked in human rights as a government official and as a member of an international NGO based in Europe. While I was looking for a job in Kingston, it occurred to me to serve on a city committee. Uh, here was an opportunity to share my expertise, to volunteer, meet people and network. In short, I wanted to get involved in my community, my new home. It was at uh, an annual city committee recruitment event at Memorial Hall, where I learned that I'm not eligible to serve on any of the committees because I'm not a Canadian citizen. At the end of the meeting, I asked what the reason was for the eligibility condition. And do you know what the answer was? Silence, nobody had the answer. Around the world, cities are on the front lines of immigrant integration because they understand that the lived experiences of settlement is intensely local. A growing number of Canadian cities are realizing that immigration is not exclusive to the federal and provincial jurisdictions, but that success or failure of immigrant integration has a significant impact at the municipal level. It is essential for our local democratic processes to be inclusive of the diversity of our community. As Canada's demographics change and we rely more on immigration to grow the labor force and population, we must open spaces for immigrant voices to help inform municipal committees and decision making. The website of the city of Kingston says, the city encourages and enjoys committee participation by interested and informed citizens. Imagine how much more beneficial it would be if the city encouraged participation by other residents of Kingston who are not less interested or informed just because they are not Canadian citizens. By engaging immigrants, the city could utilize their expertise and learn about different and innovative ways in which other communities are changing their local infrastructure systems and community health. The benefits for immigrants to serve on municipal committees are obvious. For many newcomers entering the Canadian job market, being able to network with people in their field of interest, occupation or study is critical to finding employment and it also deepens their social integration. Uh, the motion that is in front of you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, proposes to amend the bylaw to include permanent residents who have resided in Kingston for at least one year as eligible for appointment to city committees. A permanent resident is someone who has been given permanent resident status by immigrating to Canada, but is not a Canadian citizen. To maintain their status, permanent residents must live in Canada for at least two years in a five-year period. Permanent residents have the right to get most social benefits that Canadian citizens receive. They can live, work or study anywhere in Canada and they uh, have the right to apply for Canadian citizenship. They are not allowed to vote or run for a political office and to hold some jobs that need a high level security clearance. Lastly, I would like to make a reference to two important local strategic documents that speak to advancing greater inclusion of newcomers. Both the Sustainable Kingston Plan and the Kingston Immigration Strategy were developed in 2010 with the participation of um, representatives from the city of Kingston and many other stakeholders. As you can see on the screen, these documents identify a number of goals and actions that promote this idea. Mr. Mayor, councillors, tonight you have the opportunity to change the bylaw. Leadership is about change. It is not about preserving the status quo when that works against the best interests of the city. Leadership is about seizing new opportunities to allow our community and its residents to thrive. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, if you just, um, just before you go, are there any questions for the delegation? Okay, seeing none, thanks very much. Our next delegation is Saba Al Jalam and Farah Kopi, who will appear before Council to speak to Motion 4 with respect to the City of Kingston, encouraging the province of Ontario to expand the rights of permanent residents to vote in Ontario municipal elections. 
Good evening, fellow residents, mayor, city councillors, and staff. My name is Saba Al Jalam. My other home is Syria, where tens of thousands continue to suffer from war. Kingston has been my home since 2011. I am an, an internationally trained math teacher. Immigrants are the lifeblood of Canada labor force. Today, the Canadian economy is 80% reliant on immigrants for net labor force growth. In a very short time, we will not only be the sole source of labor force growth, but also population growth. This is the reality for many countries in the Western world due to aging population and declining birth rates. Kingston welcomes nearly 800 permanent immigrants each year. We may be small in number today, but the crowd is growing. We come from all parts of the world. We pay city taxes, benefit from and contribute to, to city services, shop locally, own successful businesses, and invite our global networks to visit our new home and community. Many countries and local governments are recognizing that fairness, social inclusion benefits, and government accountability are just a few of the reasons to extend the municipal vote to permanent residents. Your fact sheet lists the 40 countries that have done this. Kingston would also join with the cities of Toronto, of Toronto, Kitchener, North Bay, Guelph, Halifax, and St. John, all of which are advocating for a provincial governments to expand the municipal, to expand the rights of permanent residents to vote in municipal elections. Thank you for your time. I hope you will help us to gain our political voice here in Kingston. Thank you. Bonsoir tout le monde. My name is Farah Kopé and I'm from Haiti. I am a trained teacher and I have an international cooperation degree. Before I move in Canada, I work in my country as a teacher, a language consultant, and I work for Save the Children, a well-known ONG, for over five years. I've been living in Canada for six years, and before Kingston, I was in Montreal, where I volunteered for UNICEF, Oxfam Quebec, and Paul Gérard Lajoie. And I was not working at that time, but I actively, actively contributing in my community. In Kingston now, I serve on the board of St. Lawrence Youth Association, the afro Carib Association, and now I'm a member of the Black History Month Committee. And on Sunday, we have a big opening for the Black History Month, and we'll have the broadcaster of CBC, Adrian Howard, here to open the ceremony. Unfortunately, until recently, I wasn't able to vote. I wasn't able to vote for the municipal election. I could not put my ex near one of your names here, though I would like to do it, but I couldn't. But recently, I became a citizen like you, so I will be able to vote for the next election, and I will be able, able to vote for some of you. I understand the profound importance that comes with belonging, truly belonging to a community. Being part of a community is more than just collecting my taxes. It is also being hearing my concern, my point of view, and valuing my international experience. So I urge you tonight to support the resolution to expand voting rights for our permanent resident. We are here to stay and we have a great deal to offer to our new home. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Are there any questions for the delegation? Thank you. Okay, our third delegation tonight is Jan Van Zaldejong, Director, Total Rewards and Workforce Planning, Kingston General Hospital, who will appear before Council to speak to Clause G, Report Number 10, received from the Chief Administrative Officer, the Kingston Transit Employer Group Pass, uh, 250 plus employee rate. Good evening. I'd like to start by taking the opportunity to thank the Council on behalf of Kingston General Hospital for the opportunity to appear tonight and speak briefly about our partnership with Kingston Transit. My intent is not to speak directly to the motion before Council tonight, but rather talk a little bit about the, the success of the partnership to date. The, the partnership I'm, I'm referring to started in the fall of 2013 when KGH staff were given the opportunity to purchase reloadable transit passes via employer payroll deduction. The kickoff of this partnership also coincided with the introduction of Kingston Transit's express bus service. The express service has proven very popular with our staff and in conjunction with the easy to use reloadable passes has provided our employees with a compelling alternative method of transportation to and from work. To provide Council with an idea of the level of success that has been realized to date, within two months of the commencement of the program, the partnership, KGH had 153 employees who were enrolled in the program. That enrollment in the 12 months since has increased to over 270 employees, and we expect that these numbers are going to continue to increase with the introduction of the new express route. Uh, we already have numerous staff actually asking us when the new routes will be starting. This partnership has produced numerous benefits for KGH, its staff, and the public. Leveraging public transit has enabled us to further our objective as being as environmentally sensitive as possible. It has also allowed us to reduce pressure on the limited parking in and around the hospital uh, for those staff who truly need it. But most importantly, the partnership furthers KGH's focus on patient and family-centered care by freeing up those parking spaces around the hospital for patients and their families. We at KGH are very pleased with the progress made in a relatively short period of time. And with over 3,600 employees, we see much more opportunity to further expand this program. And we will continue to be working with Kingston Transit looking for opportunities to evolve and expand it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions. Now, my understanding is that there might be a couple of other motions to add delegations. Councillor Neal? Yes, and I left it with, uh, with the clerks. I think it's about to be posted. And since I gave them my original copy, I'll have to wait a minute. Uh, motion to waive the rules to add a delegation of Marcus Threndell and Parker Hickey with respect to new motion two. Okay, so adding a delegation requires, since we're waiving the rules of our procedural bylaw requires two thirds majority. Please vote. Still one person to vote, and that carries. Uh, Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Shell that Council waive bylaw 2010 1 to allow a delegation from Board of Directors of the Marine Museum, Christopher West, uh, to speak to Clause 1 of Report 11. Okay, thank you. Please vote. And that carries. Are there any other motions to add delegations? Okay, seeing none, we'll invite the first delegation to come forward. And again, you have five minutes. 
Wonderful. Hi, uh, my name is Marcus Trendle, and I'm here with my co-chair, Parker Hickey. Uh, together, we chair the Queen's University Hockey Helps the Homeless Tournament Organizing Committee. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk to you tonight. We'll be brief. Hockey Helps the Homeless is a national charity. It began in Toronto in 1996 and put on fantasy hockey tournaments at the corporate level. So groups at the corporate level would get together for a day of a full-service hockey tournament played alongside ex-NHLers. It's grown since then. It now involves over 500 volunteers in nine cities across Canada. And it works with local outreach partners to try and have a community-level impact in the fight against homelessness. Since 1996, they've donated over $8 million in cities across Canada. Here in Kingston, our tournament works with the Kingston Youth Shelter. The theme of our tournament is Youth Helping Homeless Youth. When we set about starting this tournament here at Queen's University last year, uh, we wanted to pick a local outreach partner that, one, had a youth-centered focus, given that we are youth taking part in the tournament. And it was great that this was also an outreach partner that was close to campus and very much a part of the community that we in Queen's students are a part of here in Kingston. Last year's funds were initially planned to help renovate the boys' quarters of the Kingston Youth Shelter. Uh, that changed a little bit as things developed on their end, and it was put towards the purchase of a property at 212 Young Street, which they are now using to start a transitional housing program. The funds raised from this year's tournament will continue to support that program. Uh, if anyone knows Jason and his team at the shelter, they do a wonderful job and a lot of great work, and uh, we fully support what they're doing to continue the fight against youth homelessness here in Kingston and put together a program that will really stand to benefit some at-risk members of our community. So Queen's is the first university level event in the country. The way we raise money for this, uh, for the youth shelter, is players raise the money to play in this fantasy hockey tournament. So for that, they get professional customized jerseys, their locker rooms are fully stocked like an NHL locker room, they get breakfast and lunch along with some prizes. So last year, we had our event at the Invista Center, six teams played, there were 72 players, we raised over $23,000. We were able to give over $16,000 of that away to charity, to the Kingston Youth Shelter and to Hockey Helps the Homeless Canada. Because of the success of that event, they are now running these universities across Canada, starting with McGill and Western this year, and we'll move it to more universities in the future. So the event for this year, we're going to seven teams, 85 players. We already have over $20,000 from player contributions and sponsorship, and there's a lot of time left to go. Most of the donations come in these last two weeks. By, minimi by minimizing the cost we hope to minimize, we hope to donate over $30,000 to charitable organizations. Uh, what we're here today is to get the ICE fees waived. ICE is a significant portion of our costs. This year, it's almost $4,300. Should the ICE costs be waived, we can instead donate the money that we would have spent on ICE. We would like to make a donation to ProKids in the order of the magnitude of the cost that's donated for the ICE. I'm sure you guys all know pro-kids, but we feel that it's very involved in with what we're trying to do here and support underprivileged youth through sport. Thank you. One of the great things that we do get to see, you know, working with this tournament is kind of the investment and the enjoyment that the guys get out of it, not only from the day of hockey, but also from the charitable side of things. So if you did notice there, every player has a minimum fundraising requirement of $250. Last year we had one individual raise $1,200. Uh, so we do see great involvement from everyone in our tournament. They really kind of get in the spirit of the charitable giving, and we get to link that with a great day of hockey, which makes it awesome. Uh, are there any questions? We'd be happy to answer. Councillor Hutchison. I was just curious with your arithmetic there. If you um, are forgiven $4,260, $4,260, and you give away $4,260, how are you coming out ahead? Absolutely. So uh, right now, I, we have donations that kind of come into, I guess, our, our tournament. And from that, we then address our costs. So right now, a cost for us is the ice cost. We would have to pay this 4300 for the ice. If that can be waived, instead of essentially paying the city of Kingston, we're able to donate that. And in talking with uh, Commissioner Hurdle and Councillor Neal, uh, we've determined that to kind of benefit the city through that, we would like to make that donation to the Pro Kids program as another local outreach partner. Thank you. Are there thank any you. other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, our, our uh, fifth delegation is uh, Mr. West, representing the Marine Museum. We'll speak to um, CAO recommend motion one. Mayor Patterson, 
Councillors, thank you for this opportunity to address you. I'm known for a penchant for rambling on, but aware of the five minute limit, I hope you'll bear with me as I read from some prepared remarks. I watched a marvelous Royal Shakespeare Company video, a recording of uh, Hamlet on the weekend. I recommend it to all of you. To be or not to be agonizes Hamlet. That is the question. We all know, at least vaguely, how the rest of that soliloquy goes, but it's the opening line, that existential question, that is most apt to our situation here in Kingston. Mayor Patterson, councillors, staff, and members of the public, for the past few feverish weeks, our community has been asking itself, is the Marine Museum to be or not to be? And if it is to be, is it to be at its current heritage location on the waterfront, the most historically significant marine museum site in Canada, or shuffled off to some as yet unknown place? The Marine Museum has played its part in stirring up debate on these questions, and we do not apologize for that. The future of our museum and waterfront is worth discussion. Has a consensus emerged, both here at City Hall and in the wider community as to our fate? We think so. Not only are we encouraged by the flood of supportive calls, emails and letters to the editor that have resulted from our efforts, we're also gratified by the substance of the Chief Administrative Officer's report number 11 on the agenda this evening. While it stops short of recommending the city commit to acquiring the museum site, it does commit the city to using every tool available to it to ensure that any private buyer of the site will be heavily incentivized to cooperate with the city in safeguarding the museum's future at the site. This is a vital step in the right direction and we urge council to support it. The CAAL's recommendation that the city request further concessions from Public Works, such as postponement of the Jan 31 deadline, may be a long shot, but it doesn't hurt to ask. And as long as you're asking, why not try one more time to get Public Works to provide the site information to the museum under a non-disclosure agreement? If we aren't a key stakeholder, with the right to know the status of the site, I don't know who is. Lastly, the CAO's proposed emergency funding in the event the museum does, does have to evacuate the site is another positive gesture. In closing, I'd like to return to poor Hamlet. To be or not to be is not just a question for the Marine Museum. It's also a question for Kingston. Do we want to be a smart city? Do we want to be a sustainable city? Do we want to be, as someone said, a 21st century city? Do we want to be a city where history and innovation thrive? As we grapple with the fate of the Marine Museum, and eventually come to a resolution, we will be setting the pattern for answering those questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the delegation? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we have no briefings tonight. Are there any petitions to present? Seeing none, we'll move to motions of congratulations, recognition, sympathy, condolences, and speedy recovery. Motions of congratulations moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Holland. 
that the congratulations of Kingston City Council be extended to Anthony Agostino on being sworn in as the 2015 Chair of the Board for the Kingston Ch Chamber of Commerce. Anthony is the President and CEO of Viva Productions and has been a member of the Chamber and its Board for several years. We wish Anthony the best of luck in his term as Chair. Moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Bohm, that the congratulations of Kingston City Council be extended to Arthur Milnes, the city's official Sir John A. Macdonald Bicentennial Ambassador, on being elected to the College of Fellows of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. The RCGS was established in 1929 with a mandate to make Canada better known to Canadians and to the world. Congratulations, Arthur. Moved by Mayor Paz Patterson, seconded by Councillor Allen, that the condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to the friends and family of Vince Garafalo, who passed away on January 7, 2015. Vince was a longtime business owner in Kingston and will be greatly missed by his many family and friends. Moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Shell, that the condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to Gord Warner, supervisor of fleet operations for the city of Kingston, on the passing of his father, Ronald Warner. Our thoughts are with Gord and his family during this difficult time. So we'll call the vote. And that carries. We have no deferred motions. Next, I'll ask for report number 10, received from the Chief Administrative Officer. It's moved by Councillor Candon, second by Councillor Allen, that report number 10 from the Chief Administrative Officer consent be received and adopted. So I'll just note from the adds that item H has been withdrawn. Is there anybody that wishes to separate any of the clauses? Councillor Stroud? G? G, please. Councillor Schell. Thank you. Uh, D, E, and F, please. D, E, and F. Councillor Bowman. Your Worship, could I have E uh, just separated by itself as well? Yes, we will do, deal with each of these separately. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other separations, then we will first vote on items, the remaining items, which would be A, B, and C. Item A is amending agreement to the new municipal hazardous or special waste services agreement with Stewardship Ontario. Item B, cartograph unlimited license agreement. And item C, award of contract one multifunctional compact urban sweeper. We'll call the vote. Still one person to vote. And that carries. Next, item D, award of contract, two half-ton extended cap pickup trucks. Councillor Shell. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Actually, I'll speak to the three, D, E, and F. Um, later on in our uh, agenda, we, will, we get a report about tenders um, that were passed, uh, were uh, awarded by staff, and council didn't see them. And tonight, uh, there are three awards of contract for what seemed to me to be fairly routine items, a uh, half-ton pickup truck, a uh, cargo van, and mid-size uh, hatchback car. And so I did inquire um, of, of staff why these were requests for proposals and not just a simple tender, so that they would appear at the very back. And the other thing that actually worried me was that there were very few uh, people who picked up the request for proposals. So another reason it's here is there weren't three uh, people who did uh, respond to this. There were two, in two cases two, and in another case only one. So I did uh, ask of staff, and we'll ask uh, at council, um, why it would appear that what seemed to be a routine type of uh, item um, is done through a request for proposal. Please. Who would like to? And so that, Commissioner Leger. Yeah, through you, Your Worship. Okay, got it on. Um, in terms of the delegated authority that's granted to staff through the purchasing bylaw, uh, first of all, I want to explain that these matters are before you this evening because we did not get three submission. Or, in the case of the first one, it wasn't separated. We got three submissions, but because of the ranking, we're not recommending the lowest submission. 
Uh, in terms of the uh, proposal, why it's a request for a proposal, in 2008, uh, Council approved a Green Fleet policy that indicated we should look at other than just price when we procure vehicles, including fuel efficiency, among other things, hybrids and those things. And I think that uh, tender uh, document, you would be focusing in on very defined specifications and lowest price. What this allows the council to look at is uh, the life cycle cost of the asset in terms of fuel efficiency over the life of the asset. It looks at just-in-time delivery for our stakeholders. It looks at uh, uh, the fuel efficiency piece, and it also looks at value added in terms of specifications. So if there are items that are base specifications in a request for a proposal, but there's additional value added at incremental or marginal cost, we can consider that as well, as long as it's for operational efficiency. So those are some of the factors that were considered back in 2008. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? So we'll call the question on item D. Please vote. And that carries. Item E, award of contract one three quarter ton cargo van. Councilor Bohm has stepped away. So we can call the vote. Okay, and that carries. Item F, award of contract, one mid-size hybrid hatchback car. So, Councillor Shell, I know you've spoken to this one as well, so we'll just call the vote. And that carries. Item G, Kingston Transit Employer Group Pass 250 plus employee rate, Councilor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. I just uh, will rise briefly to uh, offer my congratulations to my KGH colleague, uh, Mr. Van Der Zeel de Jong uh, and, and the others in that department for this excellent, the excellent progress that they made in, in reaching the 250 number so quickly and also in his uh, delegation to uh, support this item. Uh, I know that I hear about this on an almost daily basis. The, uh, the Transpass is being taken up by my colleagues at KGH, and uh, it it's really is an exciting solution to the parking problem and the transportation problem that we all face, and it is to the benefit of all downtown residents and people who work downtown. Thank you. Thank you. There's no other comments? I'll call the vote. Still one person to vote. And that carries. Next, report number 11, received from the Chief Administrative Officer, recommend. It's moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor Hutchison. The report number 11 from the Chief Administrative Officer, recommend, received and adopted. So there is just the one clause. So options to assist the Marine Museum of the Great Lakes with the Federal Divestiture of Property by Public Works and Government Services Canada. Is there anybody that wishes to speak? Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have an amendment uh, that I've forwarded to the clerks in writing. Uh, so moved by myself and seconded by Councillor McLaren. 
uh, Clause 1, Report Number 11, is here before us, received from the CAO, recommend be amended by adding the following thereto, number four, so at the very end of the recommendation, number four, that staff be directed to strongly encourage the federal government to designate the lands occupied by the Marine Museum of the Great Lakes of Kingston as an urban national park and that staff be further directed to prepare recommendations of how the City of Kingston could assist the federal government with this designation and report back to Council by June 2015. So it's been moved by yourself, seconded by Councillor McLaren. So you have the floor if you'd like to speak to it. Yes. So um, I would just like to add one more tool to the uh, array of, of arrows in, our, in the quiver that the staff has laid out for us that was alluded to just recently by Mr. West. And, and that is, this is an angle that has not been explored yet. Uh, I think just before I start, I think I'd like to state for the record that it was never a question of whether or not the people of Kingston and council, therefore, uh, love the Marine Museum or want to see the Marine Museum continue. That was always clear. That's, that's not where the difficulty lies on this file. The question, as I said before, is what can we do to help? What can we do to assist the Marine Museum to a positive outcome? I think it's fair to say that I agree with, with most of what Mr. West just said in his delegation, uh, except possibly the uh, using the Hamlet analogy, whether it's an existential question, uh, is, is perhaps more nuanced uh, a file than that. And I think that uh, therein lies the difficulty. When it's posed as a to be or not to be question, it seems like there can only be one answer. But I actually think there are uh, there, there's still a ways to go on this file. And let's go back to the beginning. So what is the land where the Marine Museum sits? It, they happen to be there. It's not by accident. They're there because they are actually a continuation of what has been there before. At one point in time, this was a federal shipyards. Uh, it has an industrial past that is linked to many other uh, places in Kingston and uh, that we're actually proud of. Uh, the Federal Department of Public Works has decided, for whatever reason, to just shut it down and, and walk away. And that's what started this whole process. Uh, luckily for us, there's more than one federal department in Ottawa. And my motion gives us an opportunity to get some of the other departments' uh, attention to this file. We don't know, we're not getting a lot of uh, explanation from Public Works about why they made their decision. They don't necessarily feel like they need to explain it. But with this motion, and with a little help from possibly uh, with, with the people of Kingston who can, can spread the word, and also uh, from the media, we can get Ottawa to sit up and listen because the history of Kingston is actually the history of Canada. That's our advantage. The people of Canada might well want to see the Marine Museum continue as well as the people of Kingston. We have to frame it as a national issue. We make it a national park. There is a precedent for this in 1999, Downsview Park in Toronto, where the Pope visited in 2002, and where ACDC and Stones visited in 2003. I know because I was at both events. Uh, Downsview Park, gigantic park in the north of Toronto, is an urban national park right now. So that is what I'm asking for. It's a much different site, but the precedent has been set by the federal government. Uh, and no matter what the outcome of our long interaction with uh, the federal government, uh, with, between the city and, and the federal government, and it might be yet a while, like I said, I remain committed to finding a solution that allows for the survival of this wonderful historic piece of all of our shared history. If successful, we would have the protection of a national, that a national park has, which is greater than that of a national historic site, which it already is. If successful, we will increase tourism to Kingston. And if successful, we will have an opportunity to teach everyone that comes to Kingston, the connection between that site 
and the shipyard whose cornerstone was laid by Sir Johnny MacDonald and whose ships uh, sailed off in World War II to fight victoriously for our country and, our, and to, to, for the future of, and the betterment of all of our children, we have the chance to show that to the world and we can make a pretty strong case and I hope I can count on your support. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak to the amendment only? The amendment only. Councillor Neal. Yes. Um, I support the amendment. Um, I think engaging other members of the federal government is a good idea. We seem to have uh, various ministries acting in various ways when it comes to uh, to property. We have correctional services who aren't known as being the most progressive of, uh, of organizations, but they respect and honor the heritage aspect of property that they're looking to, to uh, divest. And so far, they've acted very responsibly with uh, the Kingston Penitentiary site doing environmental assessments, and they seem to be committed to remediating the site. So, and, and we have parks and transportation that have begun working with the city for the Inner Harbor restoration of their site as well. So, so we have various federal ministries, we've always been a federal ministry town, who act in totally different ways when it comes to uh, property that they're looking to divest. And I wish that uh, perhaps with some of the pressure that's being put on the federal government, uh, that they may very well choose to act more responsibly with this file as well. And therefore, I think this is worthy of consideration. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison to the amendment. Yes. Your Worship. Um, I have a question to staff, and that is, is there any um, shortfall? Is there any um, negative element that I personally can't perceive at the moment for this uh, amendment? Commissioner Beach? That would, uh, that would complicate or make things more difficult. So staff haven't had a chance to fully research all of the submissions that would have to be made to the federal government, but we don't see at this time that there would be any negative impact of, of pursuing this other avenue as well, and we'd have to do the research and, if necessary, come back to council to let you know what we're doing on that side. But there's no negative that we can see at this point. Thank you. I can see that this... Um you know, certain very large questions will remain, but this could push us in the right direction if, uh, you know, federal government's willing to uh, be of assistance in this area. So I will vote for the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. I'd just like to speak uh, in favour of the amendment as it's definitely a, a reasonable request in a way that we could possibly get uh, a, a worthy uh, cause, a second look from a different department up there, and I think it's it's worth uh, uh, voting in favour of this amendment to have that uh, considered at the federal level. Thank you, Your Worship. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, through you, uh, I, I also will be supporting this amendment. Um, many of the correspondence uh, that I've received by email um, over the past few weeks have indicated the importance of our waterfront and the linkages of our waterfront to um, our waterfront master plan and the parks that we're going to. And this, um, while it could be a, a long shot, it, it is a shot that we should be taking to um, link this, especially to the uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site just up the way um, and, and connect our city even further. So I'll be supporting this amendment uh, as well. Okay, seeing no other comments, we will call the question on the amendment. Please vote. Still one person to vote. 
And that carries unanimously. So we're now to the motion as amended. So Councillor Stroud, you've already spoken. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak to the main motion? Councillor Holland. Um, thank you, Your Worship. And through you, a question to staff uh, regarding the $50,000 uh, to be set aside in the third clause, I believe, uh, to help with the cost of moving. I'm just curious um, as to whether that, what, where that number came from and whether it was, um, whether there was consultation with the Marie Museum to get that amount. Commissioner Beach. So the funding that's suggested in the report is to do a plan in case the museum has to move. So it's not to cover off moving costs per se, it's to prepare a plan where we would work with the Marine Museum and identify a plan if they had to move with 120 days notice, which they currently have on their lease, of how we would do that. So we would work with the Marine Museum to do that. Um, the number was an estimate of what we thought. We had looked at another museum that um, we had offered from council to provide some emergency funding. And uh, if more money was required, we'd have to come back to council. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I will, and I recognize you. Thank you. Uh, in my opinion, this recommendation reflects a lot of the behind the scenes work that has been happening over the last number of weeks to try to find a way forward on this file. I think that what we have here is a definition of what is doable, what is possible for the city. And there are a lot of actions here from everything from working with private sector developers to try to find a way forward on this file to being willing to put money aside to help the Marine Museum move if it comes to that. And then finally, to petitioning the federal government to come to the table to help. At the end of the day, this is their property. And I think that the city is signaling here that we are able and willing to go most of the way. But we will not go all of the way. We need the federal government at the end of the day to take a few steps toward us to make this possible. I think we're doing that in a respectful way, but I think that everything that we are asking here is reasonable. So at the end of the day, I feel comfortable that no matter what happens, that we have done everything that we can do as a city, and I look forward to that partnership with the federal government. Thank you very much. You're welcome, and I return the chair. Thank you. If there's nobody else that wishes, oh, Councillor Turner. Through you, Your Worship, I have a question concerning the deep water dock. Maybe this is to staff. Um, could we, is there any way we can preserve that so that we'll have access to it if cruise ships were to come into the city? That's my question. So the question's a little bit tangential to the actual nature of the motion, but. Yeah. But I'll, oh, sorry, uh, Commissioner will you Beach? allow it? Commissioner Thanks. Beach. So in terms of the first section where we look at the policies that um, council can look at to promote the Marine Museum staying in that location, we would also look at the other public objectives that we'd like to encourage with the site. So in terms of maintaining a, a deep water dock there, mm -hmm. that can be tied into the policies in that first section. Um, and there could be um, some either bonusing or other existing um, community improvement plan levers that we can put into place to preserve that. And uh, we would have to look at what remediation is gonna take place on the site as to what, what the options are to preserve that. Okay, so going forward into the future, that's a good possibility. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I will be supporting this motion. I'm more than happy to see that staff are trying to move the yardsticks in any number of ways. It does seem to me from the emails I've received that people are not really well informed about um, what the city has been doing. And so I'm going to use my time to say what some of that is, <laughs> just in case someone uh, doesn't know. The, City has been putting options forward to the federal government for quite some time. 
and trying to negotiate a better deal. And among that is um, an option for the for city to purchase only the portion of the property occupied by the Marine Museum, the dry dock. Uh, that was rejected by the federal government. Using, uh, it was proposed using legal agreements to respond to liability, and that's been rejected by the federal government. In other words, one of the reasons the city doesn't want the property uh, is because of the cost of remediation, and part of that could be dealt with, at least in part, because the federal government would give us indemnity against, um, against uh, being prosecuted. <laughs> And we've been prosecuted before, and it costs us millions, if people remember the Bell Park incident. Uh, I might add, there was a letter in the paper from our provincial representative um, talking about uh, what they thought should happen. And one thing the province could do is offer us, the city, indemnity against um, being uh, prosecuted for environmental offenses if we took this property over. And I haven't seen them come forward with that idea. The, um, but maybe we could ask them. So, uh, and I think we have had talks with them. That's my vague remembrance. The other thing is that uh, many examples of federal, there are many examples of federal divestitures, which Council Neal replied to, and in other municipalities. No, says the federal government. We won't do that. We won't help you with the structural repairs and site cleanup. And, um, I got eight of these. I picked up from a very good report here. Uh, they've also rejected a request to complete a site-specific risk assessment prior to closing the property sale to ensure the site could meet federal and provincial environmental regulations. In other words, they won't even let us find out what's going on, okay? They also rejected the city's request to undertake a process to initiate a request for proposals process in order to ident identify a development partner which the city could assist and take title to the site. They won't let us do that either. So they also declined a request from the city to provide provision and lease agreement for the extension to allow time after closing the federal property sale, if that's what it comes to, if it extends beyond the end of December 2015, as Marine Museum cannot pay the market rent as requested by the feds. I think you can draw your own conclusions from this. Who's trying, who's not? Who is uh, in a position to do something constructive where we would keep this site and have the museum, museum on it as we, I think, almost can't think of anybody on this council that doesn't want that. And, uh, but the federal government is simply not playing ball. And they are in this to get out with the least cost to the federal government, despite the fact they have owned the, pro the property since, well, since Sir John A. Macdonald in 1890 started it. I, th I just want the public to draw some conclusions from this. And uh, the only other thing I would add is the numbers out there, 19 to 22 million. People should reflect on the idea that we know that's a number, it's a very preliminary number, and we know we don't have all the information. When I'm talking to people, I just say, draw your own conclusions about the cost. Thank you, and I will vote for this because I still think we should be able to make a deal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Neal. Yes, just very briefly, very quickly. I, um, the one item that I believe Councillor Hutchison left off, off his list, but I've heard lots of calls about, and that's, uh, why we aren't able to share all of the information. And I just want to repeat that we have requested from the federal government the opportunity to share some of the information that they've made available to the city, but that was made available with a gag order. And they have refused to lift that condition. So Yes, we have a certain amount of information that we've made public because we've paid for some, some information and reports, but the full breadth of the information, we've, uh, we've had our hands tied uh, by the federal government, uh, by them refusing to allow us uh, to share that information with any stakeholders. Thank you. 
Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. And that carries unanimously. Moving on to Report 12 from Planning Committee. Mayor Patterson, it's my pleasure to present the report of the Planning Committee, number 12, and ask that it be received and adopted. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Shell, second, seconded by Councillor George, that report number 12 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. So just a note that uh, Clause 4 has been withdrawn. So we have 1, 2, 3, and 5. Is there anybody that wishes to separate any of those? Okay, seeing none, we'll vote on them as a whole. So item 1 is a zoning bylaw amendment for 9496 College Street. Item two is a zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision 2700 Delmar Street. Item three is a final plan of condominium 689 and 695 Innovation Drive. And item five is a zoning bylaw amendment 1292 Highway 15. So we'll call the vote. And that carries. Report 14 from the Municipal Heritage Committee. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. It's my pleasure to present uh, report number 14 from the Municipal oh. Heritage Committee and ask that it be received and adopted. My apologies. I skipped a report accidentally, oh, so we'll put that one on hold. I'll okay. uh, first ask for report number 13 from uh, the Environment, Infrastructure, and Transportation Policies Committee. Councillor Neal. It's my pleasure to submit report number Lucky report number 13 from the Environment, Infrastructure and Transportation Policies Committee. Duly moved and seconded. Thank you. So it's moved by Councillor O'Neill, seconded by Councillor Allen. The report number 13 from the Environment, Infrastructure and Transportation Policies Committee be received and adopted. So there are two clauses. Um, we'll deal with them separately. So item A is water and wastewater cost allocation and revenue collection. Councillor Bowman stepped away. So anybody wishes to comment? Okay, we'll call the vote. And that carries. Item B is a residential waste diversion rate. I'm noting that the, um, there's a recommendation that is in the negative. So this is something that lost at council. So the clause or the recommendations before us is that the following recommendation not be approved. So if you vote yes to this, then we're not approving this. Okay, is there anybody that wishes to speak? Okay, we'll call the vote. So if you vote yes, then you are saying that you do not want the recommendation passed. Councillor Hutchison, do you want to speak to it? Go ahead. I just want to point out that this was quite the debate at uh, the ITP. And, um, but uh, after rigorous debate on numerous different uh, options for waste diversion, uh, staff calmly announced that they predicted all of this <laughs> for 90% of it. And so this was my motion. It's okay to defeat it. <laughs> so vote yes and defeat it 
because it'll be in the report that follows that comes to the EITP after this, and everything will be fine. Well, we'll probably have debate then too, but uh, it'll be much more serious because it'll be in front of us to make some serious decisions. But this is, uh, I'm not gonna stand up for this because uh, we basically dealt with it and staff have, are handling it. And they said they would take it all into account. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote. Still one person to vote. And that carries. So now, now we will take report 14 from the Heritage Committee. Do you guys already have that? So it's moved by Councillor Schell, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that report number 14 from the Municipal Heritage Committee be received and adopted. So there are two clauses. Would anyone like either of them separated? Okay, saying none, we'll vote on them as a whole. Item one is a notice of intention to designate 305 323 Rideau Street. Item two is a notice of intention to designate Vaughn Terrace 426 46, 436 Princess Street. We'll call the vote. And that carries. We have three information reports. The first is tender and contract awards subject to the established criteria for delegation of authority for the month of November 2014. Any questions? Number two, 2014 priority status matrix. And number three, integrity commissioner update on RFP process. Questions? Councillor Neal. Yes. Um, it I did submit a motion, I believe it's on for next Tuesday, uh, and I shared that with the, with the CAO. So I believe that we're in a place to go forward on this file. I appreciate the assistance. Thank you. Are there any questions on this report? Okay. <laughs> okay, there are no information reports from members of council. Uh, miscellaneous business. We need a motion, um, first of all, that the resignation of Emily Marshall from the Museum and Collections Advisory Committee be accepted with regret. Moved by Councillor Schell, seconded by Councillor Osanek. Please vote. That carries. On to new motions. We have four of them. First, moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Bohm. Whereas roads in Kingston's rural area are primarily arterial, lack in transit provisions, and offer fewer options for alternate routes to connect to the city as a whole, whereas recent years have seen significant increases in both the volume and speed of road users on these routes, increasing the level of risk for travelers along these routes and at intersections along these routes, whereas countryside contains smaller communities that would benefit from active modes of transportation and require considerations and or infrastructure to ensure safe, enjoyable routes. Therefore, be it resolved that staff evaluate opportunities in Kingston's rural area for increasing overall road safety, pedestrian and vehicle safety at intersections, identify opportunities for active transportation connections within the smaller communities that comprise the rural area, and report back to Rural Advisory Committee and Environment, Tran Infrastructure and Transportation Policies Committee in Q3 2015. Councillor Allen. Um, thank you, and just uh, uh, to get started, um, the clerks uh, have advised me that it, it could be a problematic reporting structure to have uh, two, um, two committees here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get um, uh, asked for a friendly amendment to just uh, report to EITP at this point, and uh, we'll, um, I'll make sure that uh, the Rural Affairs Advisory Committee gets a chance to comment on it, if, uh, if it passes. Uh, Councillor Bowman, as a seconder, are you okay with that? Mr. Clerk, is that an acceptable, friendly amendment? To your worship, yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to try the standing thing. Um, can, can you hear me? <laughs> There's a lot of distance between you and the yeah, microphone. Yeah, I, I asked for a longer <laughs> microphone. <laughs> um, uh, so I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I just want to say that uh, this uh, 
this year, uh, road safety is something that's been important to everybody across the city. We talked about um, uh, traffic calming measures at budget last week. We talked about, uh, and unfortunately, most of those don't work in my district, uh, those types of uh, measures uh, that we were discussing. Um, my district is very uh, I interesting in the way that we are part of the, com the community, but we also have many people who work in the city and commute through my district to get to the city on a daily basis from other municipalities. Uh, and uh, there is a, a large increase, anybody who goes out there, in terms of the speed and volume on those roads. And I grew up uh, in my district, so uh, I've spent a lot of time out there and I know that. I'm also just bringing this motion to council because um, I want to make sure that uh, things that maybe are obvious uh, in the urban area, um, maybe we can find ways to apply them in the rural area. There are hamlets in small parts of density that active transportation provisions don't exist. There's no sidewalks in some of those uh, hamlets. There's no uh, shoulder on the road to walk to get to the corner store or to get to the park down the way. And we want to just create that access. And so in this report, I'm asking uh, staff to find those opportunities so that when uh, we're ready we've, uh, to invest in those opportunities, we've already identified them, we can make a move, and we can bring uh, our whole city uh, to be more sustainable, to have more active transportation, and to be safer. There, there are um, some problematic intersections. I don't know if you remember last summer, there was a really terrible accident, Joyceville Road and Mill Road. Um, and uh, it, it, it was sight lines there, and it's a two-way, uh, there's two stop signs there instead of a four-way stop sign. Um, those kinds of things are something that we should be looking at. Sorry, I keep hitting my microphone. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I'm hoping for staff to identify and look for improvements on. And uh, I hope you'll support me in this motion uh, to uh, support the safety of our roads for all of our citizens and all of the people who participate in Kingston as they uh, come in and participate in our economy. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Neal. Yes, I applaud the mover and seconder on this motion, and I also applaud the fact that the words active transportation are here, and they're now in our budget. Uh, there's a budget line devoted for that as well. Um, that hasn't necessarily been the in the vocabulary of previous councillors, but I hear from people who live in countryside that they would like to have an opportunity to cycle. They would like a, a, an opportunity to uh, to be able to more safely walk on on uh, roadsides. And so I applaud the this initiative. Thank you. So we will call the question. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Stroud, where students at Queen's University organize an annual hockey tournament, Hockey Helps the Homeless, that raises a substantial amount that is contributed to the Kingston Youth Shelter. And whereas the February 2015 tournament hopes to raise over $30,000 for this most worthy cause using the Invista Center as a one-day venue, Therefore, be it resolved that the ICE rental fees of approximately $4,500 be waived and a donation of these fees be accepted for the city's pro-kids program. Deputy Mayor Neal. Yes, um, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. This um, came to me by way of a, an email and I had an opportunity to, uh, uh, to set up a meeting between uh, Commissioner Hurdle and one, one of the proponents of this organization and typically, and I'll go on record as saying this, I don't typically support nor recommend waiving of fees because we have other ways of assisting organizations, but this is a very worthy cause. The money that, the vast majority of the money goes to an organization that is part, that is dependent to a great degree on municipal funding, and that's the youth, uh, the youth homeless shelter. And at the same time, 
And this kind of came out of the discussion uh, with Commissioner Hurdle. We have a parks and leisure initiative and budget line for pro kids that helps tremendously uh, with the city being able to assist uh, uh, children who perhaps couldn't otherwise afford to be engaged in sports. So this basically, and I know this is the tiredest, oldest cliche, but this is a win-win-win situation because it benefits pro kids, it benefits uh, hockey for the homeless, it, our youth homeless shelter, and it benefits uh, the organizers from Queens who have a wonderful event. So I hope that this, this passes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hutchison. Not to be too technical, but in the resolve clause, perhaps the clerk would tell me. Um, it says a donation of these fees be accepted. Do we have to say from whom, since it's a resolve clause that uh, most matters here? Mr. Or are we fine then? I think we're fine with that. Okay, thank you. Um, just a quick question for staff. Um, the motion says approximately $4,500, and I believe that we saw a more precise amount in the delegation. Um, do we need to be that precise in the motion, or can we leave it as is? Commissioner Hurdle? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, it can be left as is. We do have the information in terms of the exact amount, and we would work with the organization. Okay, thank you. Councillor Schell. Uh, thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, I agree with uh, Councillor Neal. Normally, I would not be uh, keen to waive uh, fees for Invista because, in effect, that would make its bottom line look worse. So I have a question for staff. Um, in effect, the $4,500 for pro kids, when it is used up, it's used, say, at the Invista or at the Memorial Centre, so it actually winds up feeding back into um, the arena's uh, budgets and that sort of thing. Commissioner Hurl. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, actually ProKids doesn't quite work that way. The, uh, the Sparks program does, where it, it actually helps to provide funding for uh, municipal recreational program. ProKids is actually used to um, enable kids to access sports with other organizations and also purchase equipment or pay for transport, those kinds of things. So it would go in, into the form of, um, of contribution either to other organizations or to purchase uh, equipment. Okay, seeing, oh, Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just quickly, I'm supporting this motion uh, because I thought it was an excellent presentation by uh, two of the nicest hockey players I've ever seen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so with that, we'll call the vote. And that carries. Moved by Deputy Ma Mayor Neal, seconded by Councilor McLaren, whereas the City of Kingston values and encourages new residents of Kingston and appreciates their involvement in our community, and whereas our current committee bylaw precludes them from joining city committees. Therefore, be it resolved that city staff be requested to bring a report to the Administrative Policies Committee no later than the end of Q2 to amend the bylaw to include all permanent residents who have resided in Kingston for at least one year as eligible for appointment to city committees with the intent to allow for such eligibility for the 2015-2016 appointments. Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, this motion came in part out of the uh, 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 a mini conference that we all attended, I believe you were there, and on a diversity conference, and talking and seeing how keen some of those uh, people were at that, that event. It just made perfect sense that we should, in fact, allow them to be engaged in the community. They work in the community, they raise their families in the community, they pay taxes in the community, and if they have a particular skill set that 
can help a, a municipal committee, I don't know why we would not embrace that idea. The other thing is we've heard from various sources, whether it be CADCO or what led to our, our, uh, our, I believe it was in 2010 when we brought forward a report on uh, trying to encourage immigration uh, in Kingston, and we've seen that that is going to be vital for the growth and success of our city, uh, why we wouldn't find ways to acknowledge, embrace, and support that. Now, I know there have been a couple of councillors that asked about the one-year eligibility. I hummed and hawed about that, honestly, for a little while. But I think, I think the reality is those six of us that sat last night through a very long meeting of uh, the nominations committee know that we take into account what the various skill sets of all of the applicants are. And so, so allowing any resident of Kingston, as I say, who may be raising a family, who's paying taxes, who's active in the community and have a, a particular skill set, we shouldn't preclude them from an opportunity to serve on, on committees. It in, increases the pool of potential expertise and potential people in the community that we can embrace. And not all communities do this, some do, but I think it gives a clear message uh, to uh, new, people who are about to become new Canadians, who are new residents and are permanent residents in Canada, that Kingston welcomes them. So I, I sincerely hope that this passes and we give a strong message to that community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Strupp. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, I have, uh, I will be supporting this, this motion and uh, and I thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Neal, for, for bringing it forward. And I look forward to seeing it at the Administrative Policies Committee um, where I sit. Uh, I do have a couple of questions for staff. First of all, is there any uh, legal uh, impediment to, to this? Uh, I don't question the mo motive of the motion, but whether it's actually legally, uh, there's any legal because I know that, for example, for the voting motion, there, there, there's actually laws in place that, that prohibit uh, permanent residents from voting. I'm wondering if there's any such thing provincially, perhaps, that might uh, be impediment here. Ms. Nicholson. Through you, Your Worship, I, I would have to research that question, to be honest, in terms of understanding uh, the nature of permanent residency as it relates to any provincial application. Um, I'm not aware of any anything at a municipal level, however, that is an issue. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Worship. We anticipated that question, so we did some benchmarking, and it varies throughout the province. Some require the, uh, the eligibility similar to what we have currently in our committee bylaw. Others don't, and they look at the diversification of the community. So where, where I can't speak about the legal aspect of it, but practically speaking, uh, it varies throughout the province. Okay. Um, I guess we'll have more time to discuss that in committee. The other question I had was regarding the one-year uh, limit. Um, how, I don't know which uh, member of staff to direct this to, Mr. Mayor, but how would we determine such uh, eligibility, would it be a volunteer basis from the applicant or uh, would be uh, proof of address or how would we do that? Mr. Clerk. Through your worship, we would amend our application form to require them to check off that, that they do meet that particular qualification and they would sign off on that as well. So it would be a self-identifying uh, eligibility requirement. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm delighted to speak in favor of this motion. Um, the delegation did a wonderful job, I thought, of 
discussing the the experience uh, of participating in a committee and how that benefits them and also just looking at the mutual benefit uh, the benefits that are enjoyed by the city as well when we get that range of experience um, Councilor Neal also touched on the fact that it's that there are many other areas uh, of municipal life that permanent residents take part in and contribute ways that they can con contribute so this is this makes things fair in a sense more fair than they have been uh, and and that's a, a reason why I feel very strongly that we should be should support it. I'd like to also just further um, address the issue of best practices of policy making and good governance, which I think is inherent in this motion. Um, a friend of mine always asks, who's not at the table? I think it's very important for us as we sit in committees uh, to ask ourselves those questions, regardless of the, the participation, the makeup that we have before us, to ask what ways we can improve the dynamics of our discussion, what ways we can be more representative. Uh, and the reality of that is the more that we are including uh, a range of voices, the more that we Im improve, th those voices inform policy, therefore we have better policy and we create greater levels of engagement which will address um, what has become a bit of a deficit in terms of our democratic system. So for all of those uh, bigger, broader picture reasons, I'm, I'm very thrilled to be supporting this motion. Uh, and I think we, all, we as a city will benefit from the expertise, but also will benefit in terms of doing something about our 40% voter turnout. Uh, that's, a, that's a bigger term objective, but I think it's addressed here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Okay, we'll call the question. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Holland. Whereas the Ontario Provincial Government is now considering municipal electoral reform, proposing preferential balloting, which our previous Kingston City Council endorsed unanimously, Whereas permanent residents are valued and active participants in our communities, civically engaged and participating in our municipalities, and whereas many democracies around the world have lowered the voting age to 16, which has further increased electoral participation, and whereas during the provincial electoral review, there is an excellent opportunity to expand the electoral franchise in municipal elections. Therefore, be it resolved that the city of Kingston reaffirms its support. Oh, hold on. Just Thank you. You just saved me a point Therefore, of order. Thank you. Therefore, be resolved that the City of Kingston expresses its support for preferential balloting in Ontario municipal elections, and that the City of Kingston encourages the province of Ontario cons to consider expanding the rights of permanent residents to vote in Ontario municipal elections, and that the province of Ontario also considers granting also consider granting election rights to those who are 16 years old or older, and that the copies of this motion be sent to the Ontario's Premier's Office, the leaders of both opposition parties, AMO, FCM, and all Ontario municipalities with 30,000 residents. Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you very much. Um, the reason this is separated from the first clause is that indeed, having consulted with the clerk and looked at the Municipal Act, um, we are empowered to do the first, the motion that we just passed. What this is doing is it's asking the province to consider this somewhat array of things that while they're going through their process of municipal election reform, which they have already uh, spoken to in announcing that they would look at the possibility of having preferential balloting for municipal elections, which is the first step towards uh, a, a, a juster way of, of conducting elections. It's, uh, so it's a, not a huge step, but something of a step away from first, first past the post. So I think it's a more equitable system. So that's the first clause. Now I'm intentionally knowing that I was going down a, an array of probably more and more, I don't want to say contentious, but debatable uh, clauses. Uh, I've 
done these so that they're separate resolve clauses. So if someone wishes to separate them, I believe the clerks and the chair would allow that. But having said that, we aren't saying that, uh, that each and every one of us or each and every citizen in Kingston favors these. We're asking that in the public deliberations of municipal election reform, that the province, at the very least, consider these as potential options. It's totally outside of our power and purview to do these things, but if they're going through a process of municipal electoral reform, it, it would make sense to me that they would consider some of these options. Other, other jurisdictions, both in, in North America and throughout the world, have adopted some of these. Uh, during the Scottish vote uh, about potentially becoming independent, 16-year-olds were granted the vote. There weren't enough of them to become independent, but, uh, but they were granted that vote. And so, so each and every one of these, I think, is at least worthy of public discussion and at least worthy of the province uh, doing a consideration of these. I would like to point out that the province was very, very careful to point out that uh, their idea of uh, preferential balloting, it sounds like they would be giving municipalities in their first blush kind of uh, explanation that they were going to give municipalities the ability to choose. So again, uh, it's we aren't necessarily saying Kingston's going to do all of these things. We're say, asking the province to consider these as they're going through their process. So again, uh, I hope we're able to support this. Uh, we've been a very unanimous group tonight. I'm sure There'll be a motion at some point in time that I've probably written that we won't be so unanimous, but I would really appreciate if, if we could support this direction. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have three um, fairly distinct propositions here. I will um, say that, uh, start off by saying that I support uh, the preferential, preferential balloting in Ontario municipal elections. As an incumbent, um, this won't help me, <laughs> but it's important to do the right thing sometimes. <laughs> um, it's quite possible somebody could second and third their way right by you. So um, I expect that in most elections it will just reaffirm the result, but uh, if people are getting a fairly large percentage of the vote. But in the close ones, it could be all the difference. And the really important thing about preferential balloting is that hopefully it will bring about a situation where 50, more than 50% of the people have indicated who they want. And so you'll have a clearer notion of the support that each of the winning candidate gets. And uh, and uh, has received. So I think that's an important um, principle and also might encourage people to take part in elections because they would really think, well, my candidate might come close, but they'll probably lose. Well, if I vote and I do preferential balloting, they might come through. So it, uh, it'll certainly make it more interesting. Think about it that way. Can you imagine the reporting on the election night? Poor clerk's office. Anyway, <laughs> but I'm sure they're up to the challenge. So the second one, the city of Kingston encourages uh, considered results of permanent residents to vote. Um, I had some trouble with that one because I think uh, citizenship is something to be treasured and highly valued. And part of that is voting in a democratic society and an important part of it. Um, 
However, it's not the vote completely. It's the vote in municipal elections. And we heard a number of arguments in the previous motion. And we've heard it before if we've been listening to, um, you know, people involved with immigration and immigration and so on. The, that this is about being in, um, being in the community, not just paying taxes, which is kind of formalistic, but, the, but being part of the community cohesion, its connectivity, its identity, and identifying people and being welcoming. And we need that. We are the lower portion of immigrants than the norm for similar sized cities. And uh, that's regrettable in a large number of ways, culturally, socially, but very importantly, economically, as we've identified a number of times around this horseshoe prior to this council. And um, I think that's important if we, the, the first motion we just passed encourages people to feel part of the community. This will do the same. And I think that citizenship will still be valued. There's issues there, but this is at the municipal level where we all are and where we can actually meet the people and live with them and work with them, play with them. I think it's important to be integrating people. And now, on the, oh, one thing I want to have somebody address, uh, the, the mover might be able to do this when they comment or someone else. We have a residency requirement in the first clause, the first motion that we just passed. We do not have a residency requirement in, um, in the second preferential clause. And, I think that's something that needs to be considered. Um, otherwise, I don't know, bus loads, boat loads. <laughs> I just don't think that's going to work. So um, Gananoque might take over, you know. I'm not sure we want that. So um, anyway, now, the, the election rates for those who are 16 years or old, older. Okay, so I made it, uh, I suggested that I- 30 seconds. I'm, 30 seconds, okay. I said I would support this years ago and ran as a federal uh, candidate, so I can't get away from that. It's also a way of transitioning people, young people to adulthood, like we do with the transit passes. You know, we get them using the transit, hopefully that will carry on, it's been shown the work. This might do the same, thank you. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor, you can speak last. If there's nobody else who wishes to speak. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, just one quick, uh, and I believe it'll be a friendly amendment. Um, they, when I first drafted this, there's, uh, they, the proposed in the adids had dropped the uh, clause which our previous Kingston City Council endorsed unanimously. Uh, I was having a seniors moment memory lapse when I said that. Uh, so we omitted that on the version on the adits. Uh, if we need a friendly amendment, I'm looking to my seconder to redeem me here, uh, to omit that. It was indeed omitted in the adits, which is the motion I think that we meant to have on the floor. Oh, okay, so just so I understand, so on the adits, what you want to do is you want to remove the first whereas clause? No, I'm sorry. No. Just the last clause that isn't on the adids, but is on the original motion here. So if, uh, if you wanted to ask the clerks, are we dealing with what is on the adids, regardless of what was so, read so earlier? So what's on the screen right now? Is that? Yes. You, that's what's before us. Yes, that's what we want. So we, I may not need. Any so amendment. Your Worship, that's not actually correct. The first paragraph, um, which reads, whereas the Ontario Provincial Government is now considering municipal election reform, proposing preferential voting, the wording following that would be deleted, which says, which our previous City Council endorsed unanimously. That wording, uh, if it comes through as a friendly amendment, is something that will be deleted. And then the first therefore clause, Initially, it talked of reaffirming uh, council support, and that's been amended to read expresses its support for the preferential balloting. Thank, so thank you very much. That was my intent. 
uh, having spoken to the clerks earlier. So, it, if uh, so, I do indeed need a friendly amendment, and I'm looking to Councillor uh, Hall Holland to Councilor be friendly. Holland, you're, 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 okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just very briefly to uh, the previous point, the reason why I didn't put the, the kind of residency criteria in this motion that's in the first motion is that I would assume that the province, when if, if they adopted this as municipal election policy, would indeed set up that criteria. It's not within our power to do so. Uh, if we wanted to give the uh, provincial government more uh, direction, anybody's welcome to move an amendment to that. But recognizing that I'm sure the province would establish some kind of a residency criteria, uh, I've just kind of left it uh, up to the province. All we're doing is asking them to consider it through their public uh, process and committee work. Thank you. So we will call the question. Please vote. And that carries. We have uh, notices of motion. Deputy Mayor Neal. Yes, so, um, I have a notice of motion that I do you, submitted. Do you, want to, do you want to read it or do you want me to read it? If you want to read it, go ahead. So notice of motion moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor George. Whereas only once is the City of Kingston engaged in integrity commissioner at a cost to the taxpayers of $53,000, which produced no recommended action. And whereas our previous council approved the hiring of an integrity commissioner on an annual retainer, and whereas an initial RFP failed to find a suitable applicant, and whereas the Municipal Act empowers municipal councils by motion and with due process to recommend the hiring of such a commissioner when and if needed, therefore be it resolved that the City of Kingston not hire an integrity commissioner on retainer and that any current RFP process to do so be canceled. Are there any other notices of motion? Okay, seeing none. Minutes. Mr. Kirk. So it's moved by Councillor Stroud, second by Councillor Turner, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 2015-03 held Tuesday, December 16, 2015, and the minutes of City Council meeting number 2015-04 held Tuesday, January 6, 2015, be confirmed. Please vote. One person to vote, and that carries. We have a number of documents, a number of communications. Any other business? So just to note that we're going to move back into closed session, but then we're going to have to come back in here to confirm bylaws. Mr. Clerk, do we need a motion then to move back into committee of the whole closed session? Through your worship, we do. We'll post it up uh, momentarily. So, great. So, can I have a mover? Moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Bohm. The council resolve itself and to committee of the whole closed meeting to agenda, to complete the agenda. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, Mr. Clerk, I'll ask for bylaws. Oh, 
Oh, we have to rise with everyone. Let's move by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Bohm, that Council rise from Committee of the Whole closed meeting without reporting. Please vote. That carries. Let's move by Councillor Osanek, second by Councillor Holland, that bylaws one through six and eight be given their first and second reading. Please vote. So one person to vote. That carries. It's moved by Councillor Candon, second by Councillor Stroud, that Clause 11.34 of Bylaw 2010-1 be suspended for the purpose of giving Bylaw 3 three readings. Please vote. That carries. It's moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Allen, that bylaws three through eight be given their third reading. Please vote. That carries. Motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Turner. Please vote. Still one person to vote. And that carries. Thanks very much.